Hey, good morning, everybody. This is Father Jim. I needed to give you a little bit of a preview before uh, the sermon coming up. As you may or may not have known, we took a pretty good lightning strike in the middle of July. It blew out all of our uh, recording equipment and streaming equipment. So right now we're in the middle of getting our finalized bids to put in a lightning restriction on the church because it doesn't make sense to put in new equipment if we have the potential of that happening again. We don't want to lose any more than we need to. So we appreciate your patience with the fact that we've been trying to piecemeal uh, our live streaming and our sermons together. So this one you're about to hear, the uh, video is fine. The sound is a little different. They say I sound kind of like Hulk Hogan. So uh, please bear with it. Uh, we hope that you'll still be able to understand the message and the purpose of what we're saying here as we talk about salt life and the life of sacrifice. Um, somebody didn't want this to get out. I even tried retaping this at the five o'clock service and we got absolutely no sound. So this is what we're working with. So again, we appreciate your prayers, your patience, as we are diligent to uh, put out the best product that we can to honor God and honor God's word. So here's the sermon. Uh, Father Jim playing Hulk Hogan. God's peace be with you, and we hope to see you in worship soon. Bye-bye. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. My back's gone out, I've lost my voice, and the Chinese we ate last night is not agreeing with me. So there is something that doesn't want you to hear what we need to hear today. This is a hard gospel and a hard topic, sacrifice. When we hear that to be a disciple of Jesus Christ means to give up that which we are comfortable with, I'm thankful you're still sitting in your pew. Sacrifice, part of the series as we talk about salt and light, to live a salt life. Last week we talked about service. What does it look like to reach out to our community, to our family, to those we know and love, to be an aid, that you are salt to the earth, you are light to the world. We are called through the powers of the Spirit and through the waters of baptism to affect our world, not be affected by it, because we know who sits on the throne and have faith and trust in that over our own strength or wisdom or capabilities. And again, to be honest, living a sacrificial life isn't easy, and especially as we live in a very selfish world. A world that seeks to serve itself at the cost and expense of others, instead of living sacrificially for the benefit of others. John 15, Jesus' last words to his disciples direct us in the way that we should go. He reminds them, I am the true vine. My father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch that bears no fruit, while every branch that does fair fruit, he prunes, grooves, and is fruitful. I am the vine. You are the branches. And we're connected in that way through God. And this is what that looks like. This is what the fruit, this is the, the, uh, uh, the work that is done in the garden that helps things grow. And as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. And if you obey my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands. And my command is this, love each other as I've loved you. For greater love has no one than this, than he who lays down his life for his brother and sister. Now, thank goodness we don't live in a country right now that we're giving up our life for our faith. But I want you to know that in this past year, more Christians have been killed for their faith than in the last 50 years. 
For the first time, we just shared the Barna group, which is the Barna is to church studies as Gallup is to world and political studies. The Barna group said for the first time, only 38% of all pastors, including the evangelicals, are preaching from a biblical worldview. They're preaching from a secular worldview. They're preaching in ways that they hope people will listen and come back and be excited. And what are we seeing? Are we seeing the growth of the church or the death of the church? You can answer. And so God calls us to a new revitalization through the Spirit. God calls us to stand firm and the teachings he has given us, because when God is present, as Jesus said, yeah, there are things that need to be pruned, and how many of us in here like the pruning process? I know I don't, but I know it's good for me. I know that there are things that still need to be trimmed away so that what God has planted, what God ordains, what God desires is that which bears the fruit and not just fruit. When we do it through the Spirit, it doesn't just happen and serve us. It serves everyone around us. God's timing is always perfect. And so when we are obedient and when we're humble before Him and when we respond in love and grace and truth, We see the concentric effects of God's blessings affect those around us in in our life. But it has to begin with that aspect of love. In his incredible work in the book of Romans, Paul gives us his treatise. It's interesting, the book of Romans is the first of his letters that we find in the New Testament, but it's actually the last of his letters that he wrote. So to get the best understanding of what Paul believes at the end of this incredible journey of his, Romans unpacks it. Theologians have said that if the New Testament were the Himalayas, that Romans would be Mount Everest, and then chapters 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 would be the peak. Therefore, he says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. One of my favorite verses. Do not conform, therefore, any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How often is the battle that we fight, the spiritual battle between these two ears? Should I? Shouldn't I? Do I? Don't I? What do I do? Do I follow what I want? Do I follow what God wants? Because it seems sometimes that what God wants for us, this discipleship aspect, is challenging this gospel today. Jesus has just fed the 5,000. He's healed some blind Folks, he's healed some lepers. He is the man with the plan. And people are following him because they're attracted to his miraculous work. And then he turns around them and he says, Okay, you want to be my disciple? This is what that looks like. Deny yourself daily. Pick up your cross and follow me. Now, with 2,000 years of distance, we can look at that phrase, pick up your cross, with some safety. What did he mean by that? You know what he meant by that. Take on that which may kill you and sacrifice for what is better, for what is good, for what is right, for what is truthful. That maybe we can sacrifice our ego for the blessings of what God has for us. Then, when we've done this, when we have not conformed for the ways of the world, when we allow the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us in discernment, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, His pleasing, His perfect will. For by grace given to me, I say to you, do not think more highly of yourself but live sacrificial. 
We hear this echo, we will in a few minutes in our Eucharistic prayers, that we are living sacrifices to God. That when we make decisions in our life, with our families, in our businesses, in our world, that honor God against and challenging the ways of our culture, those stand out. And very often we will get ridiculed. Again, the larger culture is looking at the church now and going, you believe in a myth. Look at you. Your church is dying. People aren't showing up anymore. Kids aren't here. It must mean that what you're doing isn't right, isn't true. See, the evil one's best to, uh, uh, tool is discouragement to try to get us to believe in the darkness instead of honoring and standing in the light. Galatians reminds us, I have now been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Again, that's the image of the waters of baptism, that we die to our old nature, we die to our old practices, and that can feel dislodging, can't it? When we're in a place that we don't know, when we're out of patterns that we're used to, we are so much creatures of habit, aren't we? I bet you could sit down and now write out, what do you do in the morning? And have it be a pretty consistent script. Get up, make coffee. Coffee has to be first. (laughs) Have breakfast. We do this, we do that, we do this, we do that. We have a pattern, and we like our patterns because our patterns give us solace, give us security, give us a sense that we know what's going to happen next. And when God calls us to lay some of those own pattern down, we look at him and we're like, well, now what am I going to do? Well, go to my word. I'll tell you what to do. I'll give you that direction. Again, he gives us free will in that. We were talking in the rector's form again. God gives us guardrails so that we're safe. Have you ever driven in the mountains and found a place where it was really curvy and two lanes and there was no guardrail? Did you feel more secure with the guardrail or without a guardrail? And yet there are those in our life that just, I had a guy come to me in counseling, he goes, I'm a guardrail to guardrail guy, Father Jim. (laughs) He just bounced all over. He knew he was living a crazy life, but he tried to stay within those boundaries that God had given him to move him down the lane in the journey that God had called him to. We've been crucified with Christ so that we can live new, fresh renewed lives, restored lives. And it's an ongoing thing. We are never there. It's my experience, again, that every time you think you've gotten to the core of the apple or if you peeled off that next layer of the onion, oh, good, it's, I can take a breather for a minute. Not so much. But the joy is to know that God is in the midst of what we do and how we do it because he cares for us. This whole gospel, if you've never read the letter to Philemon, it's literally one of the shortest books in the Bible. But it's an incredible story about this man, Philemon, who had his slave Onesimus. Onesimus did something that displeased him displeased Philemon. We don't know if he stole something from his household or what, but he left and ran away, and somehow he found Paul. Paul had planted the church that Philemon had now become a Christian in, and so Onesimus shows up in Paul's prison, and they begin to talk, and he begins to serve Paul, and so Paul writes his letter and asked Philemon to not only forgive Onesimus for what we've done, but now receive him, and not even receive him as a slave, but as a member of the family. And then anything that Onesimus had done, charge it to my account, Paul says. It's an incredible letter of restoration and hope for relationships that are broken. But that relationship for it to be restored needed Onesimus to be repentant of what he did and not just sorry that he got caught 
we know people that are like that, and sometimes they're like, ah, oh, I'm sorry I did that. I'm not really sorry what I did. I'm sorry that it kind of ticked you off. Instead of having true remorse in who we are and what we've done and desire restoration. It's easier to sacrifice when we know we're sacrificing for a larger goal or a higher purpose, isn't it? How many of us in here are parents of children that we've had to sacrifice for? Decisions that we've made financially, professionally, to help our children along, especially in these challenging times. Those are joyful opportunities to sacrifice for the betterment of somebody else, for the opportunity of somebody to take a new step in life, a new hopeful direction. When do we stand firm for our families to speak truth with grace and love in the midst of situations where truth sometimes is inconvenient or uncomfortable? As you'll hear me say quite often, within the Beatitudes, as God calls us to different locations, there is this place where it says, blessed are the peacemakers. Peacemakers are different than peacekeepers. Peacekeepers sacrifice truth for a false peace within a relationship or for family. I'll say what I need to say to whoever I need to say it to to make sure that we're all good. But under the surface, you know that's not the case. Peacemakers speak truth not to bash, not to overcorrect, not to uh, be unwieldy, but to invite again for new life and new hope, to bring truth into a situation. Because, brothers, and I can tell you, without truth, there is no genuine peace. It's very much like if you face a doctor. It's the worst part about being ill sometimes is not knowing what's causing it, right? So therefore, I don't know what to do with it. Sometimes, even though it may be the worst news, when we get the truth of the situation, it helps us to get our bearings and know what direction we need to take. It gives us stability. Truth brings us peace. Truth will set us free. Can we sacrifice sometimes discomfort for truth and true peacemaking in our lives? And finally, how do we sacrifice for the faith that we stand for? When it can be easy sometimes at cocktail parties to not get into that talk about the faith, not engage in what's going on, I'm going to keep it all nice. Instead of going, no, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in what he's done for me and my family. You may like it, you may not like it, and I don't know what to tell you. But I know that I know that I know that God is real and he sits on the throne. We are living in a chapter, and I, there's a sense of urgency about this, because brothers and sisters, again, we're not in the 1980s anymore. We're definitely not in the 1950s and 60s anymore. Where the culture is looking at the church with disdain and contempt. When we are to be beacons of hope, of joy, of peace, of patience, kindness and goodness do we get it all right all the time no we're not supposed to nobody is perfect but God alone what we show is care care that sometimes we show up on Sunday we're going to be a little grumpy sometimes we're going to be this way we're going to be that way but you know we're going to love each other and take care we're family as the Italians say hey it's how we do it We love each other no matter what. Because true love casts out all fear. True love is what God calls us to and to be. And we are called to be true to the faith that has been handed down to us by the saints. Because the more we water down orthodoxy, 
the more people leave the church. Service, sacrifice, and next week, spirit. How do we listen to the Spirit? How to react to the Spirit? How do we dial into that frequency of the Holy Spirit so that we can be more confident in where God leads us so that we can step out in those places of discomfort, of dis-ease, trusting that God goes before us. For again, where God leads, God provides. God directs. God doesn't call the equipped. God equips the called. You and I are called by a God who loves us and by a God who knows sacrifice better than any of us might. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to the end that all who believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.